Because footers are found at the bottom of websites, they're not something we as web designers think about often. But footers are actually pretty interesting. In fact, footers as a topic can get quite extensive. Depending on your footer, it can improve user experience, increase conversions, and even have an impact on SEO. Let's explore everything about website footers to see if we can make our future websites better and even improve existing ones. In this video, we'll first talk about different uses and types of footers. Then we'll talk about the different design of website footers and the different flavors they come in, and how I personally design them myself. After that, we'll discuss ways to make them more useful with user experience and conversion in mind. Following that, some statistics related to footers proving their effectiveness. And lastly, the SEO impact a footer has, especially for those website agencies. Let's start off with why we have footers. Footers mainly have two uses. A last resort to find content that's not in the primary navigation, whether it be contact information or rarely used pages like careers or affiliate program pages. And secondly, it can be used as a second chance to convert users. We'll touch on this later. This is to say that your website actually has a footer. Some websites think they're too trendy and too cool to have them, and their website somehow looks cleaner without one. But what they don't realize is that they're creating a bad user experience along with a slew of other negative side effects when they do this. So I shouldn't have to say this, but yes, your website needs to have a footer. It's also important to note that people do in fact use footers, and this has been proven by a study I'll mention later. Adding a footer in isn't just about following best practices. They actually do have an impact on your website's conversions and click-through rate, so they should be taken seriously. When it comes to footers, there are three types. Normal footers, infinite scroll slash the mini footer, and contextual footers. Normal footers are the ones that you're used to. They have some links and information that are the same for every page. Infinite scroll or mini footers are less common. They usually show up on social media websites, with news feeds like LinkedIn. These types of footers are actually located in the sidebar rather than at the bottom of the website. This is because if a news feed is infinitely scrolling, you would never get a chance to get to the bottom of the page. So by having it in the sidebar, it actually makes it accessible. Like the name implies, these footers are also small and usually don't have many links. Lastly, there are contextual footers. These footers are like normal footers, but depending on what page you're on, the content changes. Medium.com uses a mix of this and the infinite scrolling footer. On the homepage, it has an infinite scrolling footer in the sidebar, so they can endlessly show you posts. But on the actual posts, the footer changes to a more informative one, though still not super useful. Sometimes there's even contextual footers for if you're signed into the website or not. So it's not always based on what page you're on, but usually there's some sort of condition to know what information to display. When it comes to the design of footers, they come in many different flavors. There are small ones, big ones, light ones, dark ones, minimalistic ones, illustrative ones, mountainous ones, extroverted ones, prehistoric ones, and many more. The design of your footer is largely dependent on the design of your website to promote a unified design. What your footer ends up looking like is also dependent on the size of your website. Your local coffee shop with only 5 or 6 website pages is going to have a different footer than a giant like Amazon. When it comes to footers, I like to make them in a certain way. Considering the typical website I make is for small to medium sized businesses, I usually do a four column layout with a section at the bottom to keep the copyright and privacy policy information. The first column I dedicate for a summary about the company. I add the logo with a two to three paragraph blurb about the company and what they do. I personally think every website footer should do this as it improves user experience by communicating to the viewer about who you are and what you do without them having to think. You can also think of this as the too long didn't read section. 
I used the second column to have links the primary navigation has, plus any others that didn't quite make it. This is so if users want to get to a different page without having to scroll all the way to the top, they can easily do so by clicking one of the links in the footer. There's actually a term for this, it's called doormat navigation, because it's the first thing you see when you arrive on the website, and it's the last thing you see when you leave, or when you're at the bottom. The third column is where I put more call to action items, like services or products. It's safe to say that people that are looking at your footer are interested in your website because they've made it to the bottom. And so this is a great opportunity to give them an opportunity to take action. Lastly, the fourth column is for contact information. This one is very important because it's a web design standard, meaning 80% of websites use this approach. This should include an email, location, and phone number if possible. Sometimes I also slap social media in this column too, just to keep it organized. If you're looking for design inspiration on website footers, I suggest Pinterest. Pinterest is easily one of the best sources for inspiration for all things web design, so be sure to check it out if you ever get stuck when designing a footer. In terms of making your footer more useful, there's multiple ways to go about it. Firstly, and this should not be overlooked, is being more clear with your link labels. Having a link in the footer saying resources doesn't mean shit to the average user, so you should be more clear when possible. If your resources are actually blog posts, then label it blog or articles instead. This gives more information to the user and improves user experience. The NN group goes into the problems of vague labeling without discovery in mind and how this hurts user experience, which you can check out if you want. Another way to make footers more useful is to add awards. Awards are a great way to show some credibility. If you have three to six awards without overdoing it, the footer is a great place to do so. Be sure not to overdo it with the size or amount of them because some websites can come off as if they're compensating for something by waving them around. Another way to make your footer more useful is to add an Instagram feed. I would only recommend this if the business actually posts good Instagram photos. I can see food and art brands pulling this off quite well, but if your Instagram isn't engaging, I wouldn't recommend this because Instagram feeds add more complexity to your website and would probably have a negative speed impact, which is something to consider. In terms of Facebook and Twitter feeds, I wouldn't. In my opinion, they make a website look outdated and old-fashioned, though they can be useful if, again, the content you post is actually valuable to the user. Lastly, you can add a newsletter sign-up. The footer is a common place to find a newsletter sign-up, so a lot of users would even expect it to find it here. So by having it here, you're making it very easy for new newsletter sign-ups. Like most aspects of web design, there aren't too many stats and case studies done on footers, but I did find two worth mentioning. The first study did an A-B test. SuperOffice was trying to improve their conversions, so they started adding CTA buttons to their pages, but realized that people were missing them and not seeing them. To fix that problem, they added call to actions in the footer and saw a 50% increase in conversions in their goals that were added to the footer. Remember how I designed my website footers? The third column being the call to action type items? This is why. The next A-B test was done by Smart Insights for one of their clients. The client was Radley London, an e-commerce website selling luxury handbags based out of London. They tested the difference between their shitty one-line footer versus a mega footer that included all the categories of the products they sold. With that one simple change, sales increased 24%. However, if you did the same, I don't think you'd get a 24% increase in sales. In the before and after images, the footer could quite possibly be above the fold, so your results would vary depending on the height of your homepage. What's funny about this A-B test is that it was done in 2012, and since then they've updated their website. But on their current website, their footer doesn't even include the changes that increase their sales. Like what? Now let's talk about the impact footers have on SEO. 
I can conclusively say that footers do in fact have an impact on SEO. Even if you put the technical aspects of SEO inside, by having internal links in your footer, you encourage an increased click-through rate, which is an SEO factor. Not only that, but the footer is one of the best places to show credibility. Things like phone numbers, physical locations, emails, social media accounts, awards, contact pages, support pages, privacy policies, and more can all contribute to EAT, which stands for Expertise, Authoritativeness, and Trustworthiness, which is another SEO factor. Getting into the technical side of SEO, it's important to note that not all website footers are created equal, even if they are equal. Basically, the SEO weight of your footer is different if it's on the home page versus another page. This seems a bit useless to know if your footer doesn't change from page to page, but if you're using a contextual footer, like as discussed before, then your home page footer is worth taking a second look at from an SEO perspective. Unfortunately, footers are a common place for gray and black hat SEO techniques to take place. You'll sometimes see hidden or faded anchor text leading to landing pages inside footers. This has been a black hat technique for a while now, and Google definitely knows about it. So it shouldn't be a surprise to you that they specifically warn you not to do this in their Google Search Central SEO guidelines. Another SEO footer trick is commonly done when web agencies link back to their website from a client's website, where it could say, website designed by the website architect. Depending on specifically how you do this, it's either a black hat technique that can get you penalized, or it's something that's completely okay and safe to do. To save you from lengthy articles and watching half a dozen videos from official employees, here's the rundown on it. If you put in the footer, Web Design Toronto, or a keyword focused phrase linking back to your website, Google considers this black hat and can get you penalized. If you only like your brand name, like website designed by the website architect, then that's completely okay. Linking only your brand name is completely safe to do. If you have a company name like Websites Toronto that could look like a keyword and you link back to your website, this can appear as black hat. And so it's unofficially recommended you don't link back to your website. Overall, footer SEO is mainly about common sense. Don't do anything that will negatively impact user experience and you should be okay. If you feel like you're doing something unnatural and manipulative in an attempt to gain the algorithm, then you should consider thinking about what you're doing twice. And there it is. That's, well, mostly everything about website footers. If there's another aspect of web design you want me to cover, let me know in the comments.